right, good evening everybody. Welcome to Meteorology Lab. This is about as quiet as it gets in April. A very clear day here in Texas and we're even lacking the uh, moisture. Dew points are pretty low uh, down in the uh, 20s and 30s across much of the state. So might as well head to the charts and uh, start putting things together. This is the uh, high pressure in the ridge that came out of Canada a couple days ago. And that's cleared us out and uh, scoured out the Gulf here. And this is the uh, remains of that old front pushing out into the Atlantic right there. We're starting to pick up the uh, return flow from the south there. You can see the, the uh, isobars start at about uh, Victoria right there. And then we get about two or three of those going back out to West Texas there. So that marks the start of the uh, moisture return and let's check out the plots and uh, see what things look like. Let me get this uh, rescaled here. Head down south and uh, we should start seeing that dry line coming together here over the next couple of days and down there in south Texas still only 50s and we've even got a 38 reading there at Catula, Texas. So yeah the dry line is not quite uh, to the point where it's going to start coming together, but uh, we'll be looking out in this area here tomorrow. Looks like uh, we've got a warm front up along the Red River up to Colorado there, and temperatures behind that warm front, 70s and 80s, even in Colorado there. But out to the west, we've got a storm system moving in. Looks like that's starting its trek across the Rockies there, located uh, right around Cedar City, Utah there. So that should be crossing into Colorado over the next 24 hours and looks like uh, looks like it's fairly a potent there we've got uh, wind gusts widespread up above 40 knots and looks like the highest I'm seeing here is about 49 right there in southwest Utah so I think some of you have uh, joined to discuss dynamics a little bit so we can uh, certainly do that especially during these quiet periods in the spring this is a good time to kind of uh, get up to speed on some of that stuff. And I think probably the best place to start is how do we get low pressure? Well, there are a couple of prerequisites. Uh, if we consider the frontal models, uh, you know, typical stationary front kind of like that, Sometimes we will get a, a wave from upper level energy moving across the area and that will start some rising motion along that boundary. And then we see the progression of that into a wave, kind of like what you see here. And then the uh, last stage of that is the occlusion of that uh, system. So there are a couple ways we can get that low pressure. One of them is uh, positive vorticity advection. Now, technically, what we do is we look for the increase in vorticity with height, but uh, that's a little bit too complicated to do. A lot of times we just refer to one chart, and that gives us an idea of what's going on. So you may be wondering what vorticity is. Let me see if I can pull up this chart here. This is the College du Page heights and vorticity there, and this is valid for right around the current time there. So the the uh, darker shades that you see here in Central California, those are areas of high cyclonic vorticity or positive vorticity. And then this doesn't really show it very well, but there's very light centers like you see right there. In fact, if you look at the scale on the bottom, we go into whites and then grays. So what you're seeing here, this is a scale of absolute vorticity so this is factoring the Earth's rotation also and the components that go into vorticity there's really only two things that you have to worry about one is curvature so there's uh, out here in western California there you can see a trough lots of curvature with that trough but you may be wondering why that colored area doesn't fall right in the middle of that trough well that's because the other component to that is shear so uh, what we have here is actually, there's actually a jet. If you look at the heights, you can see the black lines. They're packed very close together along where I've drawn this blue line. This, is, this blue line is the polar front jet. And you'll notice that the vorticity 
is aligned uh, pretty well along that jet there. So this vorticity field is dominated mostly by the contributions of shear with a little bit from curvature there. So uh, with this shear, this uh, produces what we call a, uh, a channeled flow. Or, uh, yeah, that's probably about the best thing to call it there, just a channeled pattern, channeled vorticity pattern. And uh, when they're crossing the contour significantly, that's what we call an advection lobe. And especially prominent ones, uh, we can refer to those as short waves. Now the, let me see where to go with this here. Um, let me go to this uh, chart here that I've uh, prepared earlier. And we'll start with a low pressure and high pressure area at the surface. So the wind around that low flowing like that right there. And then around the high, it's pretty much this, the opposite. So there's your anticyclonic wind flow. So the air right in the middle is flowing out of the north. And as you might guess, frontal systems, they tend to favor the low pressure area because that brings the contrast together, whereas the high pressure gives us frontolysis and diffuses out those uh, temperature contrasts. So let's uh, put up the uh, temperature field. Okay, this is just kind of simplified. And this is this kind of serves as a conceptual model to kind of understand some of the stuff. So let me draw out the uh, cold front, and then I'll give you the warm front. So this is uh, kind of what we're looking at with this uh, particular chart here. So out here, this is uh, referred to as the warm sector. And then the other sector out back here is the uh, cold sector. Now another thing that you'll notice is that if you look at the boxes that are formed between the isotherms and the isobars. This gives us an idea of uh, where we might have strong advection taking place. So the smaller the box is, the stronger the advection. So this here, up the top, this is a weak advection because the uh, temperature field is, temperature gradient is kind of spread apart. But where the gradient is tight, we form uh, smaller boxes, so here we have very strong cold air advection. So basically this entire area right here, this is all cold air advection. So we can call that CAA. So what we're doing is we're taking this cold air mass right here and we're moving it south with those northerly winds. And then on the other side we've got warm air advection. On the uh, east side of that low and on the west side of the high, those are warm air advection regions. Now the surface temperature field, or the low level temperature field, does influence the upper level height field. And a lot of times you'll find that they're closely aligned. Uh, let me bring that up. So there's uh, what the upper level height field might look like. You notice that kind of sits, the, the upper level low in the trough kind of sits right over that cold air mass. And that's because cold air has a uh, very low density and so you get uh, very quick temperature or very quick height and pressure changes with increasing height. Basically the pressure drops very quickly and so does the geopotential height. So you can actually kind of use the upper level charts to find where the cold air is. You go and find the uh, low pressure regions, uh, areas of large troughing, and you can usually bet that there's some cold air underneath that. So let me go back to that pressure and temperature right there. So there's the uh, there's the fronts, and you notice that the uh, jet stream is tied pretty closely to the location of the surface low. And it's typically on the cold side of the fronts, and sometimes it'll cross very close to where the uh, surface low is, the bear clinic surface low. And very rarely will you find it south of the fronts there. Now this is uh, tied somewhat to the uh, vorticity field. Let me bring that up. I'm going to give you the 
heights and uh, the vorticity. It's going to look something like this right here. And we can throw on the jet right there. So we find that the uh, strongest cyclonic vorticity is on the uh, left side of the jet there. It's because we have the very strong shear given a cyclonic vorticity here and there should actually be some a uh, little bit of negative vorticity down on the south side. So that would be an N right there. Now if we take the heights and vorticity right there there's a similar thing that goes on if we take the boxes here. This gives us an idea of where vorticity advection has taken place. So the boxes downstream from cyclonic vorticity, this is outlining areas of very strong positive vorticity advection. So basically this entire region here, this is what we can call PVA or sometimes CVA, you'll see that too, cyclonic vorticity advection. So this is uh, what favors upper level motion. And that's one of the contributors to pressure falls right there. Um, basically where your positive vorticity of action is increasing, that's where we tend to have upward motion and uh, pressure falls at the surface there. And you'll notice that uh, this area right here that corresponds very closely to where the uh, surface low is located. So it's right out ahead of that, that uh, area of cyclonic vorticity. And then the other contribution is uh, advection. Or I should say that's one of the other contributors. This is an area here of warm air advection. So if we consider the air spiraling around that low, there's warm air down to the south, and that's moving northward. So we're basically, we basically got this area right here of warm air advection. And then on the other side, as we mentioned, this whole area here is cold air advection. So you may be wondering what the contributor of that is to uh, what's happening in the atmosphere. Warm air advection favors upward motion and pressure falls. Cold air advection favors uh, downward motion and pressure rises. And it, the, the uh, cold air advection zone, that actually helps build the surface high. And uh, the surface high that you see right here, that's going to propagate towards where the height or the uh, pressure rises or or set up right there. So the high is going to move toward that area and the surface low is going to move towards where we have the uh, stronger pressure falls. So uh, that's two things right there. Positive vorticity advection and warm air advection. Those are, those are processes that favor uh, pressure uh, pressure falls and rising motion. There are actually a couple of other contributors. Uh, friction can play into this that can enhance the uh, air spiraling into the low right there. And that enhancement actually helps strengthen the upward motion. Mass continuity means that if you bring that air closer together at a faster rate, it's going to have to move up. It can't move down into the ground. It's going to have to move upward. And another contributor is uh, diabetic heating. If you have cool air moving out over warm motion waters, you get that warming there that's going to favor upward motion and pressure falls. And the hurricane is a great example of that. So those are some of your uh, key processes there. Uh, that's basically taking the uh, basic geostrophic equations, hydrostatic equations, and uh, that tells us where we can expect to find rising motion. And this is talking strictly in a uh, synoptic environment, uh, just looking at national weather maps. When we go into the mesoscale, we get into a whole other bunch of processes that get a lot more complicated. 
but for understanding the national map this uh, will help you out quite a bit and we cover a lot of this as we go through the maps every day so I, I think I'm gonna leave it at that and uh, we're gonna cover more of this uh, tomorrow so hopefully I didn't lose too many of you but uh, anyway Let me uh, see if I, I'm just checking the overlays to see if I've missed anything, and I think that's uh, pretty much everything. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a idea what's going on. Okay, so yeah, um, positive vorticity advection. We're definitely seeing that today in Nevada and Utah. So I'm going to jump straight to an example. There's a lot of noise on this chart, so you kind of have to kind of kind of have to uh, overlook that as you're going through these charts like all this noise here a lot of that's due to orographic interactions and a lot of convection a lot of unstable air in there and uh, clot processes going on but if you look at the uh, large-scale picture this is the area of enhanced cyclonic vorticity and then downstream from that this is the area of of uh, positive vorticity advection right there. So this is where we're getting the pressure falls, focusing on northern and eastern Nevada and western Utah there. And this is kind of beyond what we've been talking about. Uh, I'm going to cover this probably more later this week, but uh, there is a negative vorticity area down to, on the other side of the jet. Typically we find that down there. And in a cyclonically curved atmosphere like that, like this, there's the positive vorticity right there. In a cyclonically curved flow like you see right here, this side of the jet will be favored for enhanced motion, so we would expect stronger upward motion in that region, stronger downward motion on the back side of that, and then these areas here are kind of indeterminate. Normally if the flow is kind of straight we would expect to see sinking motion ahead of this negative vorticity area. So if you want to read more about that uh, you can do some searches on Google and that should uh, give you there should be some references you can check out and then we're, we'll try to go more into this later this week. Okay so uh, we've got a large scale ridge across the plains right there. This is almost what we call a long wave. This is probably somewhere in between. This is probably kind of like a medium wave I guess right there. And then we have a trough out to the west right there. And then another trough on the east coast right there. So embedded in that, embedded in these troughs, we've got smaller scale troughs moving through the flow. There's probably one right here. It's very noisy, so it's kind of hard to see. And it looks like there's another one on the East Coast right there. That's probably, yeah, that's probably a wave right there. And this is what we would refer to as a short wave. So another example, probably out here, I think there's probably a little bit of an indication of a short wave there off the coast of uh, New Hampshire. So superimposed on these large scale troughs and ridges. We've got these smaller scale ones. So that's something you have to kind of be aware of as, as you go through the uh, maps. So let's uh, just take a quick look what's going to happen tomorrow since we are expecting uh, moisture to come surging north into Texas. You can see that that upper level ridge kind of moves off to the east and we come under some of the cyclonic flow from the uh, Rockies. So this is the system approaching and a good way to estimate where the surface systems are you take the uh, larger scale waves we're talking like medium scale so like this and this right here so we have a trough here medium scale trough medium scale ridge right here and you would take those and in between this is right around the inflection point underneath the jet which is right around there this is where we we would expect to find the surface system so this would be a low pressure area and then the uh, cold front that's going to extend kind of away from the jet kind of down like this and then the warm front is going to extend also away from the jet kind of downstream like that so that's where we would expect to find the frontal systems based on the upper level chart so this is a good tool you can use starting out with the upper level charts 
and then you go to the surface charts and then try to kind of put everything together and see if that matches up to the upper level charts see if you have vertical consistency there so this is a map for tomorrow around midday 1 p.m. so we're expecting to see that cold front moving out of the Albuquerque area moving around Trinidad and then the warm front lifting up through the uh, Kansas Nebraska border so even without looking at any surface charts we've already got an idea where the boundaries are going to be located so that can help you out if there's like a lot of outflow at the surface like shallow pools kind of distorting the uh, surface field you can kind of refer back to the upper level charts and try to get an idea where the larger scale features are sometimes I do have to do that there and then let's see what happens for Wednesday that upper level system moves uh, pretty quickly to the east right there already heading for the uh, southern Great Lakes Chicago and Des Moines there and then the upper level jet it's going to be right in that channeled area between the cyclonic vorticity right here and the higher values down to the south there and it also falls in this area where the uh, height contours come kind of close together in this region right here and it looks like we have another system coming up onto the California coast there let's ro roll that forward that's coming in for Wednesday into a Thursday yeah, and this one uh, digs pretty far to the southeast right there that could be heading for the Great Plains maybe for this weekend and once again there's uh, approximately where the jet is right there and we can also find the jet max that's something I haven't covered that tends to fall very close to where very close to where we find a vorticity couplet so this right here would be one part of the couplet this is enhanced cyclonic vorticity and we don't find the other side because it's kind of spread out due to this curvature but basically in here between these two regions that's where we would expect to find the jet the jet max so it appears uh, Thursday night here at midnight it's going to be just south of Arizona that's the uh, jet max right there and that's uh, the last frame of the NAM so anyway that should give you uh, some things to look for so we'll go ahead and head into the rest of the weather cast and maybe we can use some of these techniques we've gone over this is uh, something that's kind of related this is our pressure change you can see down at the bottom two hour surface pressure change this is from uh, the SPC rapid refresh model and you notice that the pressure falls and pressure rises there kind of aligned with the jet so that kind of shows you the impact that those quasi geostrophic disturbances embedded in the upper level flow and uh, the process is going on up there this shows you the impact that it has at the surface so this is an area of pressure rise or pressure falls right here and this here is the trailing region of pressure rises okay so let's head into the uh, heights and uh, or the uh, isobars and thickness right there okay so cold front coming out of Nevada right there looks like it extends into the southern California deserts and then that extends northward looks like up into Wyoming and then southeastward through Denver through the Oklahoma Panhandle and down to the Red River as a warm front and you can see that we've got this area of warm air advection let me use a different color here I'm gonna try using I guess I'll use orange okay northern plains right there this is an area of warm air advection so this is going to contribute to pressure falls in advance of this low pressure region right there in Wyoming and then on the other side we've got cold air advection very strong there in Southern California and that's going to contribute to pressure rises so our surface high is going to favor moving towards that area right there at least initially um, there are the other contributions uh, negative vorticity of action would be a contribution to 
anticyclogenesis there. So we would have to look at other things too, also diabetic processes and so on. But anyway, that would be one region to look at right there. And let's see what else we got. Uh, looks like the Hudson Bay Vortex may be weakening just a little bit. Looks like the bulk of the uh, higher or the, the stronger cold air is way up to the north there. I do see a little bit of high pressure up there in Quebec and the Hudson Bay region, so we could have maybe one more shot of cold air, I think. And then we'll just have to see if it regenerates over the next week there. So let's see what's going to happen to this Southern Plains system. This is the uh, College DuPage NAM model. And starting out, uh, this is around midday today. You can see that warm front. I'm going to have to paint this uh, blue, but this is that warm front lifting to the north. Temperatures on the south side right around 81, 82. Up to the north, very cool, 60s and 70s there. And we can watch that lift north. And we get our nighttime cooling there. So it gets a little hard to pick out, but I can still see it right there. Even at 1 in the morning, nice warm 60 degree reading there at Canadian Texas, contrasting with 47 at Woodward and 45 at Stillwater. So that warm front is still there. And then tomorrow, get our warm up. And it looks like we've had maybe a weak wave move up across Kansas. See that, that strange appearance there to that uh, frontal boundary that appears to be a kind of a weak stable wave moving along that front. And then uh, we get a lot of downslope along the cap rock right there. Temperatures all the way up to 91, Childress and uh, Canadian. And our dry line should be setting up somewhere in this area here. So I've got some other charts we can look at to uh, check that out. But by 4 p.m., looks like our dry line is roughly from about Alva down to about uh, just west of Lawton. And then I think that goes down to about Junction, Texas, somewhere in there. So a lot of our moisture will be in this area right here, Interstate 35, maybe a little bit west of there. And uh, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in about five or ten minutes here. And then uh, finally, our cold front uh, surges southward. This is the Canadian, the uh, yeah, the Canadian push of cold air. And then probably back in back here, this is probably the Pacific surge, which is being overtaken by the Canadian air. So that all pushes southward, and uh, we get another cool down towards Wednesday. I'm looking at these uh, depressed readings across East Texas and Louisiana. Wondering what's causing that. That kind of looks like it could be an outflow pool, but I'm not too sure. That could be some residual cold air that gets uh, caught up in that northerly gradient there. So anyway, we'll check that out in a, in a bit. Okay, that's probably about time to head into the chat. And typically when we do chat, I'll leave you with some satellite images. So this will be flashing here for a few minutes while it loads the frames. And then you'll get to see the visible imagery for the uh, central and western U.S. there. Okay, let me see what's going on in chat here. Got a pretty good crowd. Erica Baker, Coffeyville, Kansas. 60 degrees, winds out of the south there. Ron Chalfont checking in there from the L.A. hills north of uh, Riverside. Got 41 degrees there. We've got Mike Estwick, Fun with Tech. Robert Pleasant, Carl Burkhoff, exhausted from cleaning up the blizzard. Mike Estwick there in Denver reporting a nice warm 73. Carl Burkhoff reminds everybody to, to like. Hit the like button. Robert Pleasant says it's snowing in Tennessee. Megan John, uh, 36 in Minnesota. Burl H, 33 degrees up there in Iowa City. Got uh, Ryan Toomey's there in Florida reporting clear skies. And Justin Pulliam is here. Shirley Keast, 21 degrees in Minnesota. Over 12 inches of snow. 
And Megan John says the last snowfall broke the record for April, so Mary's getting 22 inches. Got CDMA 531 there in Houston. Jeff Crobb. Jeff Crobb, of course, is the Wind Grids author. And that's a great program, and I do need to get that up and running. Uh, Sue M33 in Indiana. And uh, let's see here, CDMA enjoying the dynamics. Megan John says the snowstorm shut down highways in the lower third of Minnesota there. And CDMA keeping praise on the books, and I appreciate that. A lot of work went into those books, especially the latest one, the Instability Scooty and Hodograph Handbook, and that was, uh, that's been a very popular title. So yeah, go to weathergraphics.com if you want to pick up any of those, any of those books, and that'll help uh, that'll help give us a little bit of spending money for heading out. To, uh, maybe we'll go get some dinner or something this weekend. Anyway, it's much appreciated. I appreciate uh, your orders and stuff. Uh, hello to Burrow H and uh, David Lumbert says Arkansas had 11 tornadoes. Tim is an OG Chase Lord from the 80s. Yeah, I was, I probably didn't get chasing in earnest until like 89. And most of my chasing was from the 90s, actually. But uh, yeah, 80s is when I started, uh, thanks to Al Moeller, who uh, gave me a lot of technical references there. Gave me a pretty good start. Uh, Sue M, enjoying the webcast, Bob Continelli. Got over a mini ice storm and CDMA 531 says grab a laminated scooty. Okay, so anyway, that's chat there. This is the water vapor imagery there from the uh, Goes West satellite. Water vapor is pretty interesting because uh, we can see where a lot of the subsidence and rising motion has taken place in the atmosphere. It tends to be sensitive to the mid and upper level, uh, mid and upper troposphere, not so much the lower levels, which is good because that helps us see where there's large scale dynamic interactions acting on the air masses. And since the uh, low level moisture is not picked up so much, it's not really biased by a lot of what's going on in the low levels. So here you can see a lot of subsidence back behind that upper level trough. And then out to the west there, some upper motion, uh, yeah, some rising motion. And also some of this is going to be subsidence, or not, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Some of this is going to be advection. This is the Pineapp Pineapple Express coming up from the subtropics, bringing moisture northward. But there also is uh, some rising motion pretty much anywhere in this region right there. The upper level low appears to be maybe in this area here, maybe Northern California. We'll have to take a look at the charts there. And uh, let's take a look out east. Wow, some very strong subsidence. And uh, Ryan Toomey's did mention the very clear weather. And wow, look how much subsidence we got. Uh, we're breaking out the uh, gray colors out across Florida there. So we should look at a scooty. Go right to the middle of that stuff and see what that looks like. Uh, Miami coming up. And it's dry there. Temperature near the, or dew point temperature near the surface, about 40 all the way up to 5,000. And then very quickly up at about 7,000 feet, we drop off to about minus 30 Fahrenheit. And that's only a few thousand, several thousand feet off the ground there. So some extremely dry air, very close to the uh, low levels. And then up here at about uh, 20,000 feet, dew points are running about minus 60 Celsius. And let me give you another sample. We'll look at Jacksonville, Florida, up in the northeast part of Florida. A little bit of moisture there in the uh, at the cirrus levels, but in the mid-levels, very dry. And uh, we can also see some of the effects of subsidence. The warm temperatures there at uh, 700 to 800 millibars. 
That's due to that sinking motion. We got that adiabatic warming in that part of the uh, SKU T and temperatures as a result running well over 50 degrees Fahrenheit at about 8,000 feet there. Elsewhere, we can uh, maybe take a look at Fort Worth. And uh, you can see we're pretty short on moisture at Fort Worth. Dew points are in the 30s and 40s in the low levels. We do have the southerly flow in place. And uh, let's take a look down around Brownsville, since that'll be up in the region tomorrow. And moisture is. Uh, a bit lacking there, about 52 Fahrenheit and only about 3,000 feet thick. Okay, so we'll go ahead and head into the forecast and start putting things together. This is going to be the NAM, and this is showing that we've got uh, quite a bit of low pressure in Colorado and northeast New Mexico. So this is largely the lee side trough. And uh, not much change over the next 12 hours, but looks like uh, by tomorrow we're going to see things. Uh, let me give you a different chart. There's not a whole lot to see there. Let's uh, check out the dew point. That'll really tell us what's going on. Okay, so we roll this forward. We're going to be under southerly flow over the next uh, 24 hours or so. And you can see by tomorrow morning, 60s are starting to come up into the Houston and College Station area. And then by convective maximum, we're looking like this. Some 60s dew points in Oklahoma, but we're still down in the upper 50s in many areas of North Texas and Central Oklahoma. Now we do have to consider the depth of the moisture. This is the 925 millibar chart. This is up at about 2,500 feet. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is tomorrow. And this is around convective maximum. What we're seeing here is uh, values of about 50. This is 50 Fahrenheit. Dew point of 50 Fahrenheit right there. And then 55 is going to run something like this right here. So you can see the moisture is a little bit weak, a little bit better around the Muscogee area. And then let's go up to 850. And we're going to see something different here. Not so much moisture. The 50 degree isodrosotherm looks like this. And then we can barely get a 55 right there around San Antonio. So dew points up at 5,000 feet across much of North Texas and Oklahoma are in the 30s and 40s. So if we go back to that dew point chart. So I'm going to put this where the dew points are about 62 around Durant, Oklahoma. And there's our uh, SKU T there. So this is probably about the best parcel we can get. We can see it, the moisture is pretty shallow. 61 degree dew point kind of falling off into the 50s and then drops very rapidly to uh, the uh, single digits there. That can be important because as you get heating going on and you mix the boundary layer, eventually some of that dry air is going to find its way into the parcels and that's going to depress the dew points, the effective dew points going up into those clouds. So uh, that can be a big problem. Also the cap, cap is uh, pretty strong there. We've got 700 millibar temperatures of 10 Celsius which is getting up into strong cap territory. So what we need is a short wave to uh, steepen the lapse rates and cool things off and erode the cap and cool the mid and upper level temperatures. And I'm not too sure we have anything like that coming in. Let me go to those, uh, let me go to the dynamics. This is where we can uh, assess the upper level dynamics. This is uh, tomorrow around midday. And look at that, hardly any dynamics across Oklahoma and Texas. So not much help there to get rid of the cap. And then by zero Z, convective maximum, maybe kind of a weak short wave through this area here, but that's a little bit too late.
some of the, the best upper level lift is heading up into Kansas and Nebraska. So that right there is kind of the story of what we're looking at tomorrow. Okay, so then let's see after the convective maximum, you can see the uh, front coming southward. And that's going to hit the Metroplex around uh, 6 in the morning. And then down into East Texas and Austin and San Antonio sometime during the day on Wednesday. So there's a chance Houston could get some showers or something. We would just have to kind of reassess things for Wednesday. I'll just take a quick look at the uh, parcels on Wednesday in Southeast Texas. And that cap is still there. 700 millibar temperatures, still almost 10 Celsius. So it's kind of iffy. I, the moisture is definitely getting a little bit better, but I'm not sure if we're going to be able to break that cap there. So at, at this point, this far off, we can kind of leave it to the models. Uh, you can see this is tomorrow at 4 p.m. NAM breaking out no precip, even by 7 p.m. no precip. And we go on into Wednesday. There's 4 p.m. and there's 7 p.m., so no precip, even in South Texas, being indicated. And then that high pressure will move in. We've got ridging moving into Texas. And then we'll pick up the moisture return on Thursday. And then we'll see how things look towards the weekend on the GFS. So let's go ahead and do that. Here's the GFS starting out uh, right now. And we can see that uh, front making its way across the Rockies. Warm front uh, lifting north. And then by tomorrow, that will be emerging out into Texas and the Panhandles and central Kansas there. And again, we're kind of lacking the moisture. Cold front will come southward tomorrow night in Wednesday. There will probably be enough upper level lift for some more snow showers here in Wisconsin where they don't need it. This is uh, midday on Wednesday. So we can see that starts out uh, around Sioux Falls, and that corridor is going to be pretty close to where it was Saturday and Sunday there. So I'm sure a lot of people are not too happy about that. The next system is coming into California and Nevada there on Thursday, and that'll cross the Rockies. And it looks like our moisture return is a little bit better. This is on Friday. The Gulf is open, and it appears the GFS is going for some showers in eastern New Mexico. So we're looking at possibly a bit of an MCS moving eastward Friday night into Saturday. And then here comes the cold air once again, another cool weekend. And the system will head into the southeast U.S. for uh, Sunday and Monday, so maybe some storms in that area. And then we're looking at a bit of an Alberta clipper coming south for Tuesday. This is on the 24th. So that's going to kind of reinforce some of this ridging. Not much going on for the week right there. And then we get into uh, Saturday the 28th. Possibly more rain for Texas. It's kind of funny how these systems are coming in at seven-day intervals. So this next one is going to affect us. Saturday from this weekend. It, at least it appears that way right now. And looks like we're getting a little bit less cold air production up north, so we may start easing into a springtime pattern as we get into May here. Still looks like a pretty strong high coming in, but uh, they, are, they do appear to be getting progressively weaker with each system. So those of you chasing, don't worry, we're going to be picking up normal May weather, I think, here. It's just going to take a couple of weeks. Let me see what's going on in chat real quick. Uh, I'm just going to kind of run quickly through the messages. Oh, yeah, spring sale. Yeah, check the weathergraphics.com site. We, On the main page, we do have a coupon that expires in a little over a week. So that will give you a discount. 
and Ryan Toomey says the month of May slowly approaches. Pacific storm systems moving east are starting to ramp up. Looks interesting on the f future GFS models. And uh, let's see here. CDMA. CDMA in uh, Houston got some good cloud gra cloud to cloud pictures from two weeks ago. I'm guessing uh, that's lightning right there. Did not hold together earlier this week. Okay. And I think that's about all I got here. Ron Chalfont says don't forget to subscribe. Yeah, if you're kind of new to the channel, please uh, consider subscribing. We could uh, be happy to see you in the uh, chat here. And uh, you're welcome to ask uh, forecast questions or just talk to anybody in there. And uh, please like also. That was also appreciated. Anyway, that's about all I got for tonight. Uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, dynamics lesson. We'll try to cover some more of it tomorrow. And uh, have a good evening, everybody. Take care.